Well, folks, we will bring you the state of the race momentarily. First, a reminder, we are now 41 days away from the most pivotal election of our lifetime. The truth has never been more critical. With Daily Wire Plus, you get uncensored daily shows from the most trusted voices in conservative media, live breaking news, hard-hitting investigative journalism. Don't wait. Subscribe right now at dailywire.com slash subscribe and stay informed. Well, again, again, this race is tight as a tick. It turns out that despite all of the media's attempts to pretend that this race is somehow a blowout for Kamala Harris, there is literally zero evidence that that is the case. Today, Politico has a piece that must be somewhat devastating for Kamala Harris, suggesting she really didn't get any sort of balance out of that much ballyhooed debate with Donald Trump. Now, as I said at the time, I didn't expect that I thought she was going to get a big balance out of it. I thought it was a blown opportunity for Donald Trump because there are only so many times in this campaign where Kamala Harris will be forced to actually answer questions about her own positions about the things she has done as vice president of the United States, about her belief system, and Trump didn't effectively press that attack. But that did not fundamentally change the race. I said, even at the time, a week and a half from now, and it can make one bit of difference that is now clear. According to Politico, Kamala Harris did not get much of a post-debate bounce. Instead of taking a clear lead over Donald Trump, the polls have shifted only slightly in the vice president's favor, especially in the battleground states, even though voters overwhelmingly crowned her the winner of the high-stakes showdown. It's nowhere near enough to change the underlying reality. Harris and Trump are still on a collision course for a very close finish in November. And when you look again at the polls, what you see is that virtually every state is inside the margin of error. According to that Real Clear Politics polling average, Donald Trump has a two-point lead in Georgia. He is almost certainly going to win Georgia, in my estimate. He is tied with Kamala Harris in Pennsylvania, within a point. In Michigan, she's up by a couple of points. In Wisconsin, they're within a point. In Arizona, Trump is up by a couple of points. Nevada is basically a dead heat at this point. Those states are really tight, plus, of course, North Carolina, which has turned into a real dogfight for Donald Trump. So this election could spin on you know, very, very small numbers. And there are a couple of lagging indicators for Kamala Harris that are not particularly good. So yesterday, for example, CNN's Harry Enten pointed out that this New York Times poll that showed that Donald Trump was winning in North Carolina, Arizona, and Georgia showed that she's actually lagging in terms of support from black and Hispanic voters, which is a disaster area for her. How about this? I think this is really interesting. All right, choice for president, Arizona, Georgia, North Carolina. All right, Hispanic voters, four years ago, Joe Biden won that vote 66% in the Sun Belt. Look at where we are now. Kamala Harris at just 52%. So Kamala Harris struggling among Hispanic voters. Donald Trump doing considerably better than he did four years ago. How about black voters? Kamala Harris, again, leading here by a significant margin, right? She's getting 83% of that vote. But that is significantly short of Joe Biden's 92%. So the bottom line is in the Sun Belt, which is much more diverse than the northern battleground states up in the Great Lakes, Kamala Harris is struggling among voters of color. Okay, this is a real problem for her. There are a couple of unspoken problems for the Kamala Harris campaign. The democratic matrix that has been built, the sort of logical electoral matrix that has been built since 2012, which is drive out minority votes and then count on suburban white ladies to bring you over the finish line. Kamala Harris is trying to do that, but she's trying to do so without mentioning her race. That is a very big problem for her. You can see why she's trying to do that. She doesn't want to lose Joe Biden's somewhat heavier blue collar base Joe Biden had some blue collar white voters in 2020 that, for example, Hillary Clinton did not have in 2016. And so she's trying to retain that base, but she is bleeding that base overwhelmingly. The Teamsters do a poll in pretty much every swing state and every single swing state shows that Joe Biden, who is leading Donald Trump by 20 points among the Teamsters. Now that Kamala Harris has replaced Joe Biden, she is trailing Donald Trump by 10 to 20 points among the Teamsters, which means there is, I think, a quiet male rebellion against Kamala Harris's candidacy. I think it's, it's not so quiet in some places, but I think there are a lot of men who look at Kamala Harris's campaign and the way that she has degraded men into some sort of beta male, Tim Walls, Doug Emhoff subservience, and they don't like it very much. And so I think there are a lot of men out there who are saying that they are undecided on this election who actually have decided that they're voting in favor of Donald Trump. So when you see polls that show Kamala Harris winning women by a huge margin, but Donald Trump only winning men by sort of a mid margin, I don't think that's right. I think Trump is going to do much better among men than the polls are currently showing. And because Kamala Harris is attempting not to alienate blue collar white men, again, she wants to hold some of Joe Biden's base, particularly in those swing states. This this election, like pretty much all the others, is going to come down once again to the blue wall states. It's going to be about Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin. Michigan is her best state. Wisconsin is her second best state. Pennsylvania is basically a dead heat at this point, which we'll get to in just a minute, because now they're pulling out all the stops. And I think the most egregious way 
I think maybe I've ever seen in a campaign. It really is kind of astonishing what they did yesterday. Truly amazing, unprecedented, as far as I'm aware, in the history of American politics. What they did yesterday in Pennsylvania. It's kind of amazing. Break glass in case of emergency kind of stuff. Okay, but Kamala Harris, in an attempt to win over blue-collar white men, has been downplaying her race in this campaign. Which, again, I think is probably better for the country. I think the sort of racial polarization ushered in by Barack Obama in 2012 has been horrific for America. You can see it in the polling data. Race relations in America were on an upward trajectory until about 2012, 2013, and then they immediately plummet when Barack Obama opens that can of worms in an attempt to get himself reelected. So I'm glad Kamala Harris isn't talking about race very much on the campaign trail, but it is true that because she's not talking about race, she is not earning as much black support or apparently Latino support as she otherwise might be. Kamala Harris, folks, is not running a very good campaign, but if she were the president, the economic situation that would follow would be significantly worse. We're looking at a proposed top income tax rate of nearly 40%, a 7% hike in corporate taxes, and she has said she wants a capital gains tax on unrealized gains, which just means pretty much every business in America is in serious trouble. Wait, there's more. They also want to add almost $2 trillion to our already staggering $2 trillion deficit every year. It's like they're trying to speed run the collapse of our economy. Now, I know you're thinking, how can I protect my hard-earned money? Well, good news. This is where our trusted sponsors at Birch Gold Group come in. Birch Gold can help you convert your existing IRA or 401k into a gold IRA. That is correct. A tax-sheltered, inflation-resistant golden ticket to financial security. And here's the kicker. You don't pay a penny out of pocket for the conversion. Look, I've been working with Birch Gold for years. They're the real deal. They understand that in times like these, you need to take control of your financial future. So here's what you need to do. Text the word BEN to 989898. We get a free info kit on gold, no strings attached. And listen up, because this is important. This is the final month for you to get your hands on a limited edition 24 karat gold plated truth bomb with qualifying purchase. That's right, folks. Time is running out fast. This is your last chance to not only protect your wealth, but also to own a piece of financial truth. Don't miss out on this golden opportunity. It's disappearing faster than common sense in DC. Text Ben to 989898. Claim your eligibility before September 30th. In a time of high taxes and high inflation, protect your savings with gold from our friends at Birch Gold. Text Ben to the number 989898 for your free info kit today. So she's lagging with white men and apparently she's lagging with blacks and Latinos in these polls. Well, that's not a recipe for victory in a very, very close election, in a turnout-based election. Now, maybe she is counting on the fact that she is radically outspending Republicans. Democrats are outspending Republicans basically almost two to one at this point. The campaigns, political ad spending in the United States, including presidential, congressional, and down ballot races, the Democratic campaigns to this point have spent about $700 million. The Republicans have only spent about $390 million. Republicans are getting shellacked in the spending race. The spending by outside groups, Democrats have spent $1.1 billion. Now remember, we were supposed to believe that Citizens United was a right-wing decision by the Supreme Court that allowed outside groups to manipulate American politics. Remember, Democrats have been complaining for years that it's these outside Republican-funded super PACs that are deciding politics in America. It's not true. Unions have been spending billions of dollars for Democrats for as long as I've been alive. Democratic super PACs spend a ton of money. In fact, again, they are currently spending $1.1 billion outside groups in this election compared to about $915 million for Republicans. In total, Democrats have spent in this election cycle $1.8 billion. Republicans are stuck at $1.3 billion. And most of the spending is, of course, concentrated in the swing, swing state. So maybe the Democrats are hoping to outspend. And one thing that's fascinating is that Democratic super PACs are not focusing on Trump anymore. They've decided they've squeezed all the blood they can from that particular stone. That everyone who's voting in favor of Kamala because they hate Trump, all those people are God. So what they are instead focusing enormous amounts of energy on is trying to create a phenomenon around Kamala Harris. And this is where, again, they have a problem. Kamala Harris is a nothing burger. She's a giant nothing burger. She's always been a giant nothing burger. She moves where the prevailing winds of Democratic Party opinion move. She tries to read the tides and then ride those tides. So in 2019, 2020, when the Democratic Party was moving in a very Bernie Sanders, Black Lives Matter direction, she campaigned as left of Bernie Sanders and left of Black Lives Matter. And then when there was a backlash, she suddenly turned into Queen Moderate, who actually was an aggressive prosecutor. She wasn't in California. According to Politico, Democratic super PACs are taking an unusual approach in this year's presidential race. They're not for focusing on former President Donald Trump. And the significant majority of this cycle spending by pro-Democratic outside groups, which typically function as attack dogs, is going to add to aiming to drive positive perceptions of Kamala Harris. That stark contrast reflects a challenging reality. Harris began her abbreviated campaign comparatively unknown to many voters, setting off a frenzy to define her in the final weeks of the election. That's particularly pronounced because this is Trump's third presidential run in a row. 
There may be little Democrats can do to persuade most voters about Trump. Instead, since Harris's elevation, according to Politico, Democrats have bet that their dollars are better spent reintroducing voters to the vice president. Which, of course, means, as I've been saying, the Trump campaign has to be focused laser-like on characterizing Kamala Harris. This campaign must be made about Kamala Harris. The same math that was always true holds true now. If this election is a referendum on Trump, he's going to lose. If this referendum is in a, if this election is a referendum on Kamala Harris, she is going to lose. It is up to the Trump campaign, outside super PACs, conservatives, to make this election about what Kamala Harris is and what she will be. That is the entire, that's the entire ball of wax right now. That is the thing that matters. We can tell that the Democrats are in a bit of a state of panic at this point, which is quite amazing because really they should be riding high. They've had nothing but glowing media coverage of Kamala Harris since they swapped out one candidate for another in the most shocking presidential move of my lifetime. And everybody just pretended that it was totally fine. It was totally normal. Zero votes earned by Kamala Harris in any primary ever. And here she was, the nominee. Joe Biden, the sitting president of the United States, was deemed too senile to be the candidate, but yet not senile enough to be ousted from the presidency. And this is all the new normal. This is all treated as normal. You would imagine under those circumstances, under the circumstances in which the Democrat media human centipede continues to operate unmitigated, that she'd be leading by five to 10 points and that she'd be running away with the race in the swing states. And that, in fact, is not the case. That is actually not a thing that has been happening which means they're now pulling out all the stops. So yesterday, this is a shocking story. It truly is an amazing thing. I've never seen anything quite like it, actually. Apparently, according to the Associated Press, under tight security, Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky on Sunday visited a Pennsylvania ammunition factory to thank the workers who are producing one of the most critically needed munitions for his country's fight to fend off Russian ground forces. Representative Matt Cartwright, a Democrat, who's among those who met with Zelensky at the Scranton Army Ammunition Plant, said the president had a simple message. Thank you. And we need more. So he's supposed to speak at the U.N. General Assembly annual gathering in New York on Tuesday and Wednesday and then go to Washington, D.C. to hang out with Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. But instead, the United States flew him into Pennsylvania. That is bizarro world. Apparently, they actually sent like a United States C-17 to pick up Vladimir Zelensky and fly him into Pennsylvania, into Pennsylvania. Well, that's weird. I feel like there's something going on in Pennsylvania. What could it be? Could it be it's the most important state in a swing state election? That basically, if Pennsylvania goes Democrat, Harris wins. And if Pennsylvania goes Republican, Trump wins. And so they're now flying in a foreign leader. The Democrats are. I mean, it's the White House. They are literally flying in a foreign leader to Pennsylvania to go hang out with Josh Shapiro, a surrogate for the campaign, and the person passed over for VP because he's a Jew. They have him now running around the state of Pennsylvania, basically campaigning in favor of Biden-Harris. I've never seen anything like this. You you talk about foreign election interference. Democrats said that in 2016, the Russians were intervening on behalf of Donald Trump. And the evidence they had is that the Russians had some cutouts were trying to retail information to the Trump campaign, information that never materialized and was never used. And then they said, oh, it's the Russians on Facebook, the Russians on Facebook. They were putting up all sorts of memes. And it turned out that the amount of engagement earned by the Russians on Facebook was less than my own personal Facebook page during that election cycle earned in one month. During the entirety of the election. So it's not the Russians interfering. Well, this is foreign election interference, like on its face. This is insane. Well, it is insane that Kamala Harris and team are now trotting out Vladimir Zelensky to campaign for them. You know what else is insane? They're actually bragging about being endorsed by the IRS union. Well, that kind of shows you where they are. They want to unleash the IRS on you. So if you're still struggling with back taxes or unfiled returns, that would be a big mistake to handle that alone. That can be a huge mistake and cost you thousands of bucks. In these challenging times, your best offense is Tax Network USA. With over 14 years of experience, the experts at Tax Network USA have saved their clients millions in back taxes. Regardless of the size of your tax issue, their expertise will work to your advantage. Tax Network USA offers three key services, protection, compliance, and settlement. Upon signing up, Tax Network USA will immediately contact the IRS to secure a protection order, ensuring that aggressive collection activities like garnishments, levies, or property seizures are halted. If you haven't filed in a while, if you need amended returns, or if you're just missing records, Tax Network USA's expert tax preparers will update all your filings to eliminate the risk of IRS enforcement. Then they'll create a settlement strategy to reduce or eliminate your tax debt. The IRS is the largest collection agency in the world. Now that tax 
tax season is over, collection season has begun. Tax Network USA can even help you with state tax issues. For a complimentary consultation, call today, 1-800-958-1000, or visit their website at tnusa.com slash Shapiro. That's 1-800-958-1000, or visit tnusa.com slash Shapiro today. Do not let the IRS take advantage of you. Get the help you need with Tax Network USA. Flying in a foreign leader to literally campaign in a battleground state is unheard of. I don't know why it's a good move for Zelensky, by the way. It seems to me an awful move for Zelensky. Any foreign leader at least has to maintain the patina of attempting to reach out to both sides of the aisle. It is a foolhardy endeavor to attempt to cultivate only one side of the aisle. Even Benjamin Netanyahu has been totally rejected by the Democratic Party, so much so that Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer literally went on the floor of the Senate and called for his ouster as the Prime Minister of Israel, elected. Even Even Bibi Netanyahu tries to make calls to Joe Biden, tries to meet with senior Democratic leaders. If they reject him, that's their problem. But Vladimir Zelensky flying in at the behest of the White House to Scranton, Pennsylvania, to tour munitions factories is one of the single worst decisions I've ever seen a foreign leader reliant on American bipartisan support make. It's bizarro world. He is not flying in to make an address to Congress invited by the Democrats, for example, and some Republicans don't show up. That's what happened to Netanyahu back in 2015 and then again this year. Netanyahu was invited by Congress. Some Democrats didn't show. Not the same thing. He is literally going to an arms munitions factory in a swing state and being given a tour by Josh Shapiro. This is the equivalent of Donald Trump in the latter days of an election using the White House to personally fly Benjamin Netanyahu, for example, to the United States to campaign in Florida for him. To send him to like Michigan to meet with Jews living in the Detroit suburbs and thank them for their support. Like, that's so weird. It's not only weird, it is very bad. This is not how foreign policy is actually done in the United States. Having an administration fly in a foreign leader to go do your rabble rousing for you in a swing state. Now, you know what they're doing. What they're, I mean, Kamala Harris made this apparent. During that debate with Donald Trump, she randomly sort of name-checked Polish Americans in Pennsylvania. It was the weirdest call out I've ever seen, I think. I mean, it was like, I, I've never seen such a specific political call out in the middle of a debate before. There are about 800,000 Polish Americans who live in Pennsylvania. She specifically called them out in an attempt to say that they had to be in favor of her because Donald Trump is not sufficiently in favor of the Ukraine war, for example. It, it, was, it was a perfectly obvious thing that she's doing. So we know what she's doing right now. She's bringing in Zelensky to go campaign in favor of the votes of Eastern Europeans who have historically lived under the thumb of the Russians. That's what she is doing. So Zelensky heads on over to Pennsylvania. Here is footage of him touring this munitions factory. And that is Josh Shapiro signing the munitions. The governor of Pennsylvania. Now, again, not unusual for politicians to sign munitions aimed at America's enemies. And this also happened in Israel. Nikki Haley famously signed munitions that were aimed at Hamas and Gaza. But it is weird to fly Vladimir Zelensky into an American munitions factory in the swing state of Pennsylvania in order to rabble rouse. That's bizarre. And not only that, Zelensky then did an interview with the New Yorker magazine where he specifically called out the Trump fans ticket. So Zelensky was asked about Trump's statements about Ukraine. He said, my feeling is Trump doesn't really know how to stop the war, even if you might think he knows how. With this war, oftentimes, the deeper you look at it, the less you understand. I've seen many leaders who are convinced that they knew how to end it tomorrow. And as they waded deeper into it, they realized it's not that simple. And then he specifically said that J.D. Vance was, quote, too radical. And the New Yorker said, Vance has come out with a more precise plan. He said, to give up our territories. He said, his message seems to be that Ukraine must make a sacrifice. This brings us back to the question of the cost and who shoulders it. The idea that the world should end this war at Ukraine's expense is unacceptable, but I do not consider this concept of his a plan in any formal sense. This would be an awful idea if a person were actually going to carry it out to make Ukraine shoulder the cost of stopping the war by giving up its territories. But there's certainly no way this could ever happen. This kind of scenario would have no basis in international norms and UN statute and justice, and it wouldn't necessarily end the war either. It's just sloganeering. And then he was touring around again, in Pennsylvania. That is such a weird move. It's a particularly weird move for Zelensky because he's going to need Republican support if he wants more arms flowing his way. 
It was a Republican House of Representatives that passed a massive aid package that included aid to Israel and Taiwan, yes, but mostly to Ukraine. Many Republican leaders still believe the Ukraine should be funded sufficient to withstand a Russian assault on Kyiv, for example. So him openly campaigning in favor of the Harris campaign is wild. It's totally crazy. According to the Associated Press, the 155 millimeter shells made in the Scranton plant are used in howitzer systems, which are towed large guns with long barrels that can fire at various angles. With the war now into its third year, Zelensky has been pushing for the U.S., to give permission to use longer range missile systems to fire deeper into Russia. Now, this is unique. I, I, I truly have not seen anything quite like it. The sitting leader of a country being shipped in by the White House to campaign in a swing state. Does that count as Russian? Does that count as Ukrainian election interference? Does that? Like when you literally have the leader of a foreign country coming to the United States at the behest of the White House in order to campaign, what else would you call that? Does that count as election interference? And again, this is coming from somebody who's in favor of continuing to fund Ukraine sufficient to pressure Russia into a deal because I don't ha see how any other deal is going to get done. If you stop funding Ukraine, for example, then Russia is going to increase its aggressive activities in Ukraine, prolonging the war and making it worse. Even for me, I'm like, what the hell is Zelensky doing? And more than that, how untoward for the Biden-Harris administration to ship him to Pennsylvania. That is so openly political. It's insane. But it shows the desperation of the Biden-Harris campaign. It shows that they think this whole thing is going to come down to Pennsylvania and maybe, maybe, maybe they can jog, they think, the Polish-American vote, which, by the way, is likely going to go for Donald Trump. Polish-Americans have historically in the state of Pennsylvania been blue-collar workers who are in industries like fracking. They tend to be Catholic, which means culturally conservative. So Harris is trying to make inroads by using Ukraine as the lever. Well, this election is keeping a lot of people up at night, but it's not just the election. It is also... The stuff that you have on your bed, okay? You've got a bunch of uncomfortable bedding. I know it was cheap, but that's not what you should have on your bed. I've just got my entire bed with bowl and branch. Now, I'm not usually one for changing with the seasons. My principles are consistent. But when it comes to bedding, different thing. Starting with the bowl and branch signature collection, their 100% organic cotton sheets are like the constitution for your bed. Foundational, timeless, they get better with age. They start off buttery soft and somehow get even softer with every wash. Plus, you can easily add their blankets, duvets, and quilts without making your bed feel heavy or hot. Trust me, a fall refresh with bowl and branch will have your mind changed for good. Best of all, Bull & Branch gives you a 30-night worry-free guarantee with free shipping and returns on all U.S. orders of 100 bucks or more. Let me tell you, when you're fighting the culture war day in and day out, good sleep is crucial. Start getting your best sleep this fall with Bull & Branch. Enjoy 15% off plus free shipping on your first set of sheets at bullandbranch.com slash Ben. That's Bull & Branch, B-O-L-L-A-N-D, branch.com slash Ben for 15% off and free shipping. Exclusions apply. See site for details. That's bullandbranch.com slash Ben for 15% off plus free shipping. This is a campaign that's got some desperation about it. That really does. It's, it's pretty incredible. Now, meanwhile, the business community is bizarrely trying to talk itself into Kamala Harris, which makes no sense at all. So Kamala Harris has apparently been making an undercover push to win over corporate America. Now, I talk with corporate leaders all the time. I talk with tech leaders all the time. There is a gap emerging in CEO world against Kamala Harris. They realize that Kamala Harris is basically a cutout for the Bernie Sanders ideology. They look at the fact that, for example, the Biden administration put in charge one of the most anti-capitalist people in America, Lena Khan, in order, in order to basically stymie capitalist mergers. Here is the chairwoman of the FTC, Lena Khan, yesterday claiming that it was corporate consolidation that was responsible for inflation, which, by the way, is nuts. It's not true at all. She says much of the blame for the exorbitant prices on everything from food to concert tickets is widespread corporate consolidation. The FTC's mission is breaking illegal monopolies, blocking mergers that stifle competition, and protecting consumers from a system Lena Khan says is rigged against them. Too often, fewer and fewer companies are controlling more and more of the market. And what that means is companies can start ripping you off, hiking prices, stealing from you. And she is awful. Everybody in the business community, by the way, knows she's awful. Everybody in tech world knows she's awful. She's become a byword in CEO land for somebody who wishes to stop the mechanisms of the free market from working. And by the way, when you prevent corporate consolidation, which very often means greater efficiency, what you are doing is actually increasing prices. 
but the Biden administration put her in place. And you can see CEOs desperately trying to talk themselves into the lie that somehow the alligator that is Biden Harris Sanders is going to eat them last. One of the people who's doing this is Texas billionaire Mark Cuban. Cuban, of course, has become a big Kamala Harris supporter. His proposition seems to be never hold her accountable for anything she's going to say or tie her to the Biden administration in any way, shape or form. I know Mark Cuban a little bit seems like a very nice guy, but he is wrong on this. According to the Wall Street Journal, Texas billionaire Mark Cuban only occasionally spoke with President Biden or his aides. But when he thought over the summer that drug industry middlemen were hiking up the cost of medicines to drive independent pharmacies out of business, he found an eager sounding board in Kamala Harris's presidential campaign. Cuban, a celebrity entrepreneur who dabbles in politics, has spent hours in recent weeks on phone calls, texts, and email chains talking with the Harris campaign about the pharmacy problem, an issue he's familiar with because of an online pharmacy he co-founded and taxes, Wall Street, and the deficit too. By the way, normally we would call this corporate cronyism. When CEOs talk with Democrats, that's just good old-fashioned business. When CEOs say to Republicans, will you leave us alone? That's corporate cronyism, according to the legacy media. And remember, when I cite the Wall Street Journal, and I'm not reporting from their opinion pages, the Wall Street Journal's news page is actually to the left of the New York Times' news page. But according to the Wall Street Journal, like past Democratic candidates, Harris has made taking on wrongdoing by American corporations a central part of her pitch to voters. But in private, at least, she's making a quiet play for corporate America's support, seeking out advice from leaders across sectors. She has offered few policy specifics, but many executives say they view her openness to their feedback as enough for now. They're just talking their way right past this graveyard. She's hosting dinners of eight to 10 chief executives at the VP's Naval Observatory residence, according to attendees. And many of these CEOs are desperately attempting to talk themselves into fetch. They're trying to pretend that Harris is actually not anti-capitalism, that she is going to be a friend to business. She is absolutely not. And again, many of these corporate CEOs are specifically talking about getting rid of Lena Khan, chairman of the FTC. That includes major Democratic donor Reid Hoffman, but Harris has tried to move away from that. And it, 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 there is this tendency among American CEOs that's really quite pathetic. It truly is pathetic. American CEOs, let's say founders, people who build businesses, they have this pathetic belief system that if they just, all they really want is just a little more of my money. If I'm just a little more self-sacrificial, they'll leave me alone. No, they won't. The entire ideology of a Bernie Sanders or yes, a Kamala Harris is that if you are a billionaire, you should not exist. They're not coming to eat a foot. They're coming to eat the whole thing. They want to tear down business in the name of equity. It is a thing that they believe. Again, the single most important political quotation of my lifetime with regard to corporate and, and business policy comes from Barack Obama, circa 2007, open debate. He has asked, if you increase the capital gains tax rate and it lowers government revenues because the economy shrinks, will you still do it? And he says, yes, for purposes of fairness. In other words, they don't care. This is not about the economic impact. This is not about balancing the budget. It's not about reducing deficits. It's not even about increasing government revenues. It's about punishing success. But you have people like Bill Gates. Again, just because you're good at business does not mean that you understand politics in any way, shape, or form. In fact, very often there's a reverse correlation. Here's Bill Gates suggesting, well, yeah, I think the wealthy should pay more in taxes. But Bernie would say you can't become a billionaire. It's not about the wealthy paying more in taxes. The wealthy could have all of their tax, uh, the wealthy could have literally all of their property confiscated tomorrow and it would pay for approximately six months of federal government funding. Here is Bill Gates. Again, they keep trying to walk their way past this graveyard and it is not going to work. If I was in charge of the tax system, I would have paid a lot more in taxes. I'd have about a third as much money as I have. Hmm. Now, Bernie would go further. He would basically say that you can never be a billionaire, that at that point, the government's going to take away 100%. Okay, pathetically showing your neck to people who want to destroy you does not save you. All of Bill Gates' efforts for the last 30 years to try and buy his way back into the polite societies of the left wing have not earned him much with the left wing. AOC still sees Bill Gates as a villain and always will because he built a business. That is bad to the left. Well, Bill Gates, it seems like he's been picking the Democrats, and that is an unwise pick. But let me tell you about wiser picks. One of my producers, Jake, is a huge fan of prize picks. For tonight's baseball games, Jake picked Shohei Otani to have more than 1.5 hits, runs, and ribbies. It seems like a good pick. And for Aaron Judge, have a hitter fancy score of less than 9.5. Jake is always raving about how easy it is to make entries on all his favorite players in numerous sports. Prize Picks is America's number one daily fantasy sports app with over 5 million active members. Here's how it works. 
You pick more or less on two to six player stat projections and watch the winnings roll in. It's that simple. Right now, they've got a deal that's almost too good to be true. In September, just one Caleb Williams passing yard gets you an automatic win every football weekend. That's right, one yard, four weeks of free wins. Listen, I'm a Chicago Bears fan. I'm skeptical, but that's a pretty, pretty good pick. Don't wait. This deal vanishes when September ends. Here's something else that sets prize picks apart. With prize picks, you can win up to 100 times your money with as few as four correct picks. And with their injury insurance policy, if your player leaves in the first half and doesn't return, your picks are still live. It's almost like they actually care about their members. Speaking of members, prize picks puts them first. All withdrawals fast, safe, secure. When your picks hit, you can get your money in as fast as 15 minutes. And get this, they invented the flex play. You can still cash out even if your lineup is not perfect. Double your money. And even if one of your picks doesn't hit, you will still do well. Download the Prize Picks app today. Use code Ben. Get 50 bucks instantly when you play five bucks. That's code Ben on Prize Picks to get 50 bucks instantly when you play five bucks. You don't even need to win to receive that $50 bonus. It's guaranteed. Prize Picks, run your game. Also, by the way, you may have noticed that our educational system is becoming trash. You know, all the campuses are coming back right now. Get ready for some awful protests. Well, Grand Canyon University is a place you won't see that. It's a private Christian university in beautiful Phoenix, Arizona. GCU believes we're endowed by our creator with certain unalienable rights. Life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. GCU believes in equal opportunity and that the American dream starts with a purpose. GCU equips you to serve others in ways that promote human flourishing and create a ripple effect of transformation for generations to come. By honoring your career calling, you impact your family, your friends, and your community. Are they pursuing that bachelor's, master's, or doctoral degree? GCU's online, on-campus, and hybrid learning environments are designed to help you achieve your unique academic, personal, and professional goals. With over 330 academic programs as of December 2023, GCU meets you where you are, provides a path to help you fulfill those dreams. The pursuit to serve others, that's yours. Find your purpose at Grand Canyon University. Private, Christian, affordable. Visit gcu.edu. That's gcu. Edu. Again, go check them out right now. Grand Canyon University. Got the values you want and the education you need. That's gcu.edu, gcu.edu. Kamala Harris, again, I'm just going to point out, Kamala Harris has never run or owned a business. Chuck Schumer has never run or owned a business. Barack Obama never ran or owned a business. Nancy Pelosi has never run or owned a business. None of these people have ever run or owned a business. They are career government leeches. And what they believe more than anything else is that wealth creation is an act of sin. Wealth creation is exploitation in their generalized worldview. Now, they lie about it. They say all the time that, oh, we, we still believe in capitalism. You hear Joe Biden say this. I'm not saying you can't earn. I'm just saying you got to have something fair. He just never defines fair. You know, the, the exception eats the rule. By fair, he means that he should be able to seize all the privately created wealth he can and use it for his various purposes. And maybe he'll take a, a, a medieval indulgence from people like Bill Gates in order to buy off support for a moment. But that's just corporatism, not actual free markets. The business community trying to talk themselves into Harris is truly an astonishing thing. So, by the way, is the, is the American population that is trying to talk themselves into the idea that, that she's not radical in some way, shape, or form. Here is footage of Kamala Harris in 2018, literally protesting deportation of illegal immigrants with, wait for it, Jussie Smollett. Remember Jussie Smollett? He's the guy who pretended that... Um, he was attacked on the mean streets of Chicago by MAGA-hatted white supremacists with a rope, and they threw bleach on him. You remember that? And it turned out to be a giant lie. Well, here she was campaigning with him in 2018 against a deportation of illegal immigrants. There's Juicy. Juicy Smollier. There they are, chanting about no deportations. In 2018, with Jussi Smollier. Don't worry, she's not a radical, guys. By the way, she was literally asked yesterday if she would fulfill her 2019 promise to offer citizenship to 2 million dreamers. She was asked by Axios. Because back then, she said she would use executive order to offer a pathway to citizenship to 2 million dreamers and then shield another 6 million undocumented immigrants from deportation. The campaign spokesperson just refused to answer. Quote, the vice president has fought for dreamers throughout her career and is proud of the actions taken under her and President Biden to expand protections for them. As president, she'll continue to protect dreamers. So they just reject any sort of answer on the positions. This is the essence of the Kamala Harris campaign. Hide what she's about. Pretend she is something that she is not. And then apparently ship Vladimir Zelensky to Pennsylvania to go campaign for you. Truly amazing. Now, meanwhile, the Biden-Harris administration continues to be utter garbage in terms of actual policy. There's a major war in the Middle East right now. Israel 
has finally responded to a year of 10,000 rockets being fired into its sovereign territory by another sovereign nation, the nation of Lebanon. That nation has, as part of its governing coalition, Hezbollah, a terrorist group. That terrorist group is an Iranian proxy, and they've been firing 10,000 rockets into northern Israel, depopulating the entirety of northern Israel. There are no civilians there because all the civilians are living in hotels in the middle of central Israel right now. That started in coordination with the Hamas attacks of October 7th. So finally, Israel having completed most of its major military operations in Gaza, turned north and said, guys, you better back it up. You better stop the rocket fire and back it up so we can have people, you know, live in their homes on our side of the border. And Hezbollah just kept firing. So finally, Israel activated what has been the single most devastating war launch in the modern era. It's astonishing. I did the beeper attack, which took down the entire communication structure of Hezbollah in Lebanon and took out Thousands of terrorists wounded them, many gravely, killed dozens of them. Then they blew up their walkie-talkies. So the terrorists couldn't talk with each other. Then Israel promptly took out nearly all of the major heads of Hezbollah. Right now, the meetings of the Hezbollah upper echelon is Hassan, is Hassan Nasrallah, the leader of Hezbollah, alone in a room with a mirror. That is the entire upper echelon of Hezbollah. So Israel did that in the first couple of days of the war. Then they proceeded to knock out 50% of all long-range cruise missiles and other ordnance in the first day. The intelligence that Israel had was so good that they actually had pictures of Hezbollah ordnance in private homes. That's how good Israel's intelligence was on the ground in Lebanon. And so they've been going very heavy. They've been, they, they, they sent out 80,000 phone calls to citizens of Lebanon telling them, get out of your house if you have Hezbollah ordnance underneath your house. Hezbollah, by the way, has an active program. That's what, the evils of Hamas and Hezbollah are unbelievable. Hezbollah has an active program. The program is they literally will subsidize your rent and pay it for you if you agree to live above their missiles. That is a thing that is government policy led by Hezbollah in Lebanon. It's insane. Okay, so here's, I mean, this is a cruise missile in somebody's house in Lebanon. Israel released these pictures to show what they're hitting. So they're blowing up all the ordnance. By the way, you can see that Israel is right because in virtually all of the videos, you'll see an Israeli piece of ordnance hit an apartment building. And then you will see a bunch, a bunch of secondary explosions. That's all of the missiles and the rockets that are hidden inside those supposedly civilian residences. So unless they're storing up fireworks for July 4th, it turns out they got a bunch of rockets and explosives inside these private apartment buildings. So Israel has been going very hard. They're ramping up the strikes. The idea is to pressure Hezbollah to pull back north of, if not the Latanya River, even further north to make safe Israel's north. And Israel, remember, voluntarily gave up the areas of southern Lebanon that it was occupying in order to ensure its own safety in 2000 and gave it over to the UN to try to keep it Hezbollah free. The UN promptly turned over the entire area to Hezbollah, which promptly staffed it up, armed it up, and put hundreds of thousands of rockets there. Here is Benjamin Netanyahu yesterday, the Prime Minister of Israel, saying Israel's war isn't with the Lebanese people, it's with Hezbollah, which of course is true. I have a message for the people of Lebanon. Israel's war is not with you. It's with Hezbollah. For too long, Hezbollah has been using you as human shields. It placed rockets in your living rooms and missiles in your garage. Those rockets and missiles are aimed directly at our cities, directly at our citizens. To defend our people against Hezbollah strikes, we must take out those weapons. Now, starting this morning, the IDF has warned you to get out of harm's way. I urge you, take this warning seriously. Don't let Hezbollah endanger your lives and the lives of your loved ones. Don't let Hezbollah endanger Lebanon. Please, get out of harm's way now. Once our operation is finished, you can come back safely to your homes. <laughs> Have you ever seen a war conducted like this? It's truly amazing. The news media, of course, are doing their damnedest to defend Hezbollah as per their usual Sky News, which is a trash outlet. They had a headline yesterday, quote, Hezbollah has been provoked like never before by Israel and may be tempted to unleash its firepower. Hezbollah has been provoked by Israel? For a year, Israel took incoming rocket fire that depopulated an entire swath of their country. Sky News. What a joke these people are. But they do have allies in the White House. We'll get to that in one second. First, see the groundbreaking documentary from Matt Walsh that became his first cultural phenomenon. What is a Woman is the film that started it all. Now, again, you've heard that Am I Racist is blowing it up at the theaters, and it really is. Am I Racist has now earned $9 million at the theaters minimum, and it's still going. But you can't get that unless you go to a theater. What you can do is see 
the groundbreaking first documentary that Matt made, What is a Woman? Which is an amazing documentary. You need to join us as a Daily Wire Plus member. You can watch it on demand anytime you want. The hit documentary tackles one of the most debated questions of our time. And Matt Walsh's journey to find an answer has captivated audiences across the world. See What is a Woman? For yourself, go to dailywire.com slash subscribe. Join today. Use code DW30 for 30% off your new Daily Wire Plus membership. Okay, meanwhile, leave it to the Biden administration to get it wrong as always. All the Biden administration has to do to ensure peace in the Middle East right now is get the hell out of the way. That's all they have to do. Seriously, the IDF is doing bang up work in Lebanon. They are attempting to minimize civilian casualties despite the fact that as always, terrorist groups legitimately hide their weaponry in civilian areas. It is what they do. It is their entire strategy. They know that left-wingers are morons and that if they do that, and then a sovereign nation has to defend itself against terrorists, civilians will die, and then they blame the sovereign nation for defending itself. That, that is the entire game. Terrorists know the game. It's been their entire strategy all along. It didn't work in Gaza because the Israelis didn't stop. And now they've devastated Hamas's war-making capacity and Hamas has lost command and control status in the Gaza Strip. This is why there's been speculation that Sinwar is dead, because he's so isolated at this point, the head of Hamas, that he can't even communicate with his top leaders. In fact, it's not even clear who the hell the Americans think they're negotiating with at this point. It might be Habib, the third-rate Hamas fighter, who's actually a 17-year-old guy with an AK. That's how bad the command and control structure is in Gaza because of the devastating effectiveness of the Israeli defense forces in Gaza. In Lebanon, it's, it's significantly more upgraded than that. The intelligence did not have a window into Hamasistan in the Gaza Strip for Israel. They have great intel on the ground in Lebanon, apparently, like amazing intel. Every day they're taking out top Hezbollah commanders. And they're ratcheting it up in the hopes that this will prompt Hezbollah to say, okay, guys, we cry uncle, we're pulling north, we don't want any more of this, or we just won't exist anymore. And if Israel has to, Israel will, in fact, send ground troops over the border in order to clear that area and ensure that it cannot be used as a base for operations against Israelis again. So what is the Biden administration, what they should be saying? The obvious answer is Israel's got to do what it's got to do. Sorry, guys, you're the ones who decided to let your country, which was once a nice country. Lebanon at one point was considered a nice country. Beirut was considered a Paris of the Middle East. It was a Christian country, by the way. It was run by the Christian Maronites. And then the PLO arrived and promptly sent that country spiraling into hellhole status. And then the Iranians moved in and sent it further into hellhole status. So what exactly is Joe Biden doing instead of just saying, you know, our allies have to do what they have to do in order to protect themselves. Instead, he says, we're working to de-escalate. Uh, you, you've done some solid work in the de-escalation category, you know, all, all the way through here, Joe Biden, by saying words out of your face hole. And what, what's his plan for de-escalation, by the way? Talking? Because they've been doing this the whole time. Amos Hochstein has logged more miles than the Motel 6 guy. Amos Hochstein, the U.S. envoy to the Middle East, that dude is basically just logging up stamps on his luggage like Paddington Bear. It's an absurdity. And you know what he's accomplished? Nothing. Because one side of this supposed negotiation is a terrorist group that does not care about civilians. Here's Joe Biden, again, being a fool. I've been briefed on the latest developments in Israel and Lebanon. My team is in constant contact with their counterparts, and we're working to de-escalate in a way that allows people to return to their homes safely. Well, I mean, as long as you just say the word de-escalation. It's like Kamala Harris's answer every time she's asked about Gaza. Just, well, yeah, you know, we have always been and always will be and always are every day seeking a deal. It's like, okay, that, that doesn't mean anything. That doesn't mean anything. And I'm seeking a deal with Bill Gates to put me in his will. And you know what? It ain't happening because it's stupid. The, these morons. Ben Rhodes. The, the fact that Ben Rhodes was ever a high-level ranking member of the foreign policy establishment is an astonishing thing. Truly, Ben Rhodes is one of the most dunderheaded, wrong-headed fools in the history of American foreign policy. This dude was writing bad short stories in his Brooklyn apartment, and then he was dragged by the Obama administration into a position of prominence, knowing literally zero things about anything. And somehow here he is talking about foreign policy now. The challenge for the administration is that Israel is the prime actor here. They're the ones driving events. Prime Minister Netanyahu is the key decision maker. And he just doesn't appear to be listening uh, to President Biden. Well, that's the big problem is he's not listening to the uh, credulous old man who has solved zero problems during his presidency. Joe Biden is the worst president since Jimmy Carter, bar none, maybe worse. Truly an awful president. By the way, Ben Rose's nickname, I'm not even kidding. His nickname, the person who was just talking, in the Obama White House, his nickname was, wait for it, Hamas. Not even kidding. That is a real thing. So again, Kamala Harris, 
The only way she gets elected is simply by avoiding talk of any of this. Now, in another piece of astonishing news yesterday, and this really is an amazing piece of news, apparently the DOJ has now released a letter that was on the, that was, it was a handwritten letter from the suspect in the second Trump assassination attempt. It was placed in a box containing tools and building materials left at the home of an unnamed associate. And they released the letter publicly. Well, that's weird. That's strange. It's weird how every manifesto that seems to, you know, I don't know, somehow forward a left-wing agenda, every manifesto like that is released. Every manifesto of, say, a shooter at a, at a Christian school in Tennessee is somehow hidden for months. So what exactly was in the letter? It was a letter urging others to finish the job and offering $150,000 to anyone who managed to kill the Republican presidential candidate. So I have a question. Why was that released publicly? Might there be someone who takes that seriously and thinks that perhaps shooting Donald Trump will get them $150,000? Like, why is that made public? Bill Barr, former attorney general, he came out. He was like, what are they doing? Why in the world is this public right now? So that is a strange story and has raised yet more questions about the process of the release of these sorts of materials. Meanwhile, in other news, you know how Kamala Harris and, and the Democratic Party, they keep saying the crime is down? Well, that's, that's weird because it isn't actually down. According to the Wall Street Journal's Jeffrey Anderson, he says U.S. urban crime rates are actually up because the FBI doesn't get reports. This is what, this is what Donald Trump actually said during the debate. He was falsely fact-checked by David Muir and Lindsey Davis about all of this. He was right. Crime rates in urban areas are not, in fact, down. A new finding released this month by the National Crime Victimization Survey found that crime rates have not been falling and urban crime is far worse than it was in the pre-George Floyd era. That new NCVS report for 2023 finds no statistically significant evidence that violent crime or property crime is dropping in America. Excluding simple assault, the type of violent crime least likely to be charged as a felony, the violent crime rate in 2023 was 19% higher than in 2019. That is the last year before the BLM riots. America's recent crime spike has been concentrated in urban areas, which... Shock, shock, are governed largely by Democrats. The urban violent crime rate increased 40% from 2019 to 2023. Excluding simple assault, the urban violent crime rate rose 54% over that span. Even murder stats are being skewed because there are a bunch of major cities that don't actually report their murder stats to the FBI. So just remember, the governance of the Biden-Harris administration has been awful, which presumably is why they are now relegated to unleashing Ukrainian president on Pennsylvania as a campaign gambit. All righty, guys, coming up, we'll get into the latest on the P. Diddy scandal because pretty much everybody was involved, it seems like. If you're not a member, become a member. Use code Shapiro at checkout for two months free on all annual plans. Click that link in the description and join us. Republicans are Nazis. You cannot separate yourselves from the bad white people. Growing up, I never thought much about race. It never really seemed to matter that much, at least not to me. Am I? Racist. I would really appreciate it if you love. I'm trying to learn. I'm on this journey. I'm going to sort this out. I need to go deeper undercover. They gonna say I'm racist. Joining us now is Matt, certified DEI expert. Here's my certification. And what you're doing is you're stretching out of your whiteness. This is more for you in this field. Is America inherently racist? The word inherent is challenging there. I want to rename the George Washington Monument to the George Floyd Monument. America is racist to its bones. The so inherently. Yeah. This country is a piece of... White folks, white trash, white supremacy, white woman, white boy. Is there a black person around here? What's a black person right here? Does he not exist? Say I'm racist. Hi, Robin. Hi. What's your name? I'm Matt. I just had to ask who you are because you have to be careful. <laughs> Never be too careful. They gonna say you racist. In theaters now. Rated PG-13.